Hey everybody, welcome back. This week I'm going to switch gears a little bit again and look at a fire alarm acceptance test. Uh, this was a request from Decatur, Georgia, and I think it's a good route. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue on this trend and do some inspections principles um, over the next following weeks and hope this is a good route for you. When beginning the fire alarm acceptance testing, ensure the approved construction plans are present. The contractor should have these on the construction site. Um, I always have a set on my iPad, but that still should not exempt the contractor from having a set. Ensure the technician is at least a nice set too, uh, if he's in the state of Alabama. Other states may differ. The panel shall not indicate any problems, so it should be green and normal with no deficiencies. Step one is to verify that the AC circuit is dedicated, labeled, and locked. This is all per NFPA 72, so as you approach the panel, it should be labeled on the outside. And then as you come inside the panel, it shall be labeled exactly like this with a breaker lock. This prevents somebody from turning the AC power off for any reason. To start the test, what I do is I remove the breaker lock and turn the AC power off. What that does, it should enunciate a trouble condition on the fire alarm control panel within 200 seconds. It's actually going to tell you AC power loss or something similar. With the power still off and running on battery backup, this is a good chance to check the batteries on full load. So to make sure those battery calcs were correct. So what you're gonna do, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna activate a manual fire alarm box and I'm going to check and let it run for five minutes for general occupant notification and 15 minutes for voice evacuation. This is also a good time to measure manual fire alarm boxes to ensure they're between 42 and 48 inches above finished floor. This is important. Older manual fire alarm boxes were mounted at 42 to 54 inches, but that's no longer accepted. This is a good chance to ensure that all strobes are synced, and this is usually enough time to verify operation of all notification appliances throughout the facility. Once I've walked the building, I'm going to go back to the main fire alarm control panel and ensure the signal and the location are correct. And in this case, as you can see on the left, they are. Once the time has elapsed, in this case is five minutes, I'm going to silence the signal and ensure that both horns and strobes cease. And in no situation should strobes continue to flash. And FPA 72 says both shall cease. Something to note is that when you're walking around looking at notification appliances, ensure that the candela matches what was indicated on the plans. As you can see, it says 30 here on this device to the left. That's 30 candela. Um, they can also be on the sides or on the back, so it just depends. Also ensure that the devices produce greater than 15 dB above ambient sound level if they're public mode devices. That's why I like to carry around a dB meter, just to be sure. Before moving to step four, make sure that you turn the AC power back on to the fire alarm control panel. Now we move into step four. For starters, we want to make sure that the batteries are labeled with the manufacture date, not when they're installed. Next, we want to unplug one battery lead and look at the fire alarm control panel. A trouble should indicate within 200 seconds of unplugging that battery lead. In step five, I blow canned smoke into at least one detector. I ensure that proper operation and enunciation of the panel is provided. When I look at the panel, I want to make sure that I receive a fire alarm signal. I also want, if it is an addressable panel, the actual device number and a location. In step six, I remove a smoke detector from its base to ensure that a trouble is, is enunciated at the fire alarm control panel within 200 seconds. This is to ensure that we have supervision on our smoke detectors. In step seven, I'm gonna do something similar as I did to the smoke detectors. I'm gonna have the technician remove a wire from the notification appliance. This also, also should provide a trouble on the fire alarm control panel display within 200 seconds. Note this is also a good time to measure these uh, notification appliances to ensure they are mounted between 80 and 96 inches above finished floor if they're wall mounted. 
Step eight is to test the duct smoke detectors. The code provides the option for these to be programmed as alarm or supervisory conditions. For me, I, provi I, I require these to be supervisory conditions. The code specifically says that duct smoke detectors do not take the place of open area detection. And that's why that I don't. Also, they are known for nuisance alarms. I typically test these with canned smoke through the sampling tube. In step nine, you're gonna get some funny looks from the technician, but have the installer create a ground fault on the system. He can do this in multiple ways, but what you wanna do is ensure that that trouble condition and that ground fault is enunciated on the display of the fire alarm control panel. Step 10 is communications. If you have a DACT with two phone lines, unplug a phone line and verify that there's trouble enunciation and it identifies it as communication fail. Also, ensure that Central Station has a valid address and the proper business name. Also, ensure that the Central Station has the correct number for your fire dispatch agency. The office number to the police department or your office number of the fire department is not acceptable. Note that communications is a hot topic today and there's a lot of performance-based alternatives out there. So note that you've got to determine a way to test those performance-based alternatives. If you're choosing to use cell or private radio um, or other forms of single path communications. So make sure that you're aware of these and you're familiar with ways to test them appropriately. Step 11 is sprinkler devices. All sprinkler devices shall be tested with both the sprinkler and fire alarm contractors present. Have the sprinkler contractor turn each valve and watch for a supervisory and then have him flip them back the other way and watch for that restore. You want to flow water and ensure that you have alarm activation on both wet and dry sprinkler systems. Also, you want to partially bleed air for low air supervisories on dry systems. Step 12, we'll talk about other ancillary items that we test. Phase one elevator recall. That's something that I usually test with the elevator inspector at a separate time. Fire door hold up, hold open devices. There's usually smoke detectors within five feet of those doors. I like to test those there. Type one hood micro switch. Ensure that goes into alarm and identifies correctly at the panel and other additional fire alarm features that may not be included here. Step 13 is concluding the test. When we're done, we want to ensure all systems are normal. We have a green light and the panel's clear. Ensure that the fire alarm is off of test with the monitoring company. Ensure the company tag is in place on the panel. Have the company complete and submit the record of completion with all signatures. And then we want to place all manuals and the program in the required document box adjacent to the panel. Lastly, we want all keys. Know that this video is not all inclusive and is a brief explanation of a fire alarm acceptance test. I hope that it was helpful for you and I hope that if you have questions you'll reach out to me and post those.